started um, with this webinar that I've been super, super excited for. Um, it is a continuation of some work that we're doing, some CCRS uh, technical assistance support um, with the idea of making thinking visible. And it's called Get Them Talking, Promoting Classroom Conversation. Um, as we are working through this webinar, if you have tech issues, you can use your chat box and chat directly to Astrid and she will help you out. So on this webinar today, um, me, Christine Kelly, I'm the Atlas ELA and Literacy Coordinator. And Patsy and Astrid, would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure, this is Patsy. Um, thanks so much for joining us. I'm excited to hear more from our panelists and to get thinking about this topic. And this is Astrid Leiden from the Department of Education. As Christine said, I am here to help out with any technology issues you might have. We do have everyone muted uh, to cut down on background noise, but we would love to hear your questions and comments throughout the webinar. So there are uh, a couple ways you can do that. You can use the chat feature on your control panel um, and chat out your questions at any point as we're hearing from our panelists and then we have time uh, for them to answer your questions at the end of each section. You can also use the hand icon on the control panel to raise your hand and we can unmute you so you can ask your question orally. So thank you all for being here. Okay, unfortunately, Lindsay can't be with us, um, but she did so much of the work um, coordinating the presenters uh, and putting this together. And so thank you, Lindsay. Um, she's awesome. And we are going to move forward. So our objectives today are the following. To understand the connection between students making their thinking visible and effective CCRS implementation. We're going to hear from teachers from a variety of levels and contexts about strategies to, and routines they have used with their students to promote classroom conversation. That's easily going to be the best part of the webinar. And to learn strategies and routines for getting students to talk in intentional academic ways. This idea of making thinking visible is obviously popular. I know Lindsay and I just did a three hour workshop at Language and Lit and people were really excited about it. So I'm, I'm glad we're going to continue in that theme. So the question, why bother with strategies for getting students to talk? And we want to make student thinking visible. There's all kinds of things going on in their minds. And we want to hear what's going on um, so that we can um, better understand how they're thinking, how they're processing, solving problems, how they're perceiving themselves and their abilities. So a huge part of this is making student thinking visible, constructing viable arguments and justifying reasoning, uh, developing arguments supported by evidence, making sense of problems, no matter what content area, summarizing information, finding and articulating the main idea. These are very complex processes and we can only see what students are thinking via what they write or what they say. So we are really excited to have a panel of people today, and we do know so many smart people. And um, we've got some math, different levels of math. We've got ESL, we've got One Room Schoolhouse, we've got it all. And so without further ado, I am going to turn over to Amber Deliger, and she is gonna share some amazing uh, work that she's doing with math students. So Amber, just let me know when you want me to click ahead. You can click ahead. Oh, that's me. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amber Deliger. I am currently teaching algebra at Anoka Ramsey Community College in a partnership with our college and our ABE location. My students are from low intermediate basic to high adult secondary all in the same class. So that's exciting. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started, Christine? So this quote is really important to me. The person doing the talking is the person doing the learning. And it's attributed to lots of different people from Polya to Vygotsky, 
there's lots of people who are saying this, but it's really just coming up on my radar while I'm doing this work with our students. Um, I really think it fits seamlessly into the mathematical practices that are we're using to move our students towards more active learning rather than just passive calculations. And um, there's a lot of articles coming out recently um, that are really talking about how students learn differently from each other than they do from an instructor. And that's causing me to think about um, am I the one doing all the talking? Because I already know this stuff. And so I'm really using this as a quote that is on my mind every day as I'm planning my lessons. So what do we do? So if we um, want to get started, we also need to acknowledge that active learning where we have students engaging and talking and, and um, leading the classroom can be a really big trigger for anxiety for a lot of our students, especially those that come from a background where students aren't in, encouraged and engaged, um, especially orally with their mathematical thinking. Um, so if just as a reminder and something to keep in our minds that um, reactions to anxiety caused by public speaking and math can be overwhelming for some students. And it can take some time to build trust with our students and for them to feel comfortable enough to take risks to do these things in the classroom. It may look like anger, avoidance, joking, or even the silent treatment. Um, all of these things are normal and they can be overcome, but they're gonna need some support, so don't give up. I want you to consider that there are some some supports that you can build in, especially using some of the ACEs um, routines and norms, but also there's other outside resources such as the U cubed student resources that can help you start a discussion around growth mindset and the value of mistakes and taking risks in a learning environment. So the strategies I want to share are simple, low-risk ways to start building the culture of learning that values creativity and sharing. I think we don't spend enough time thinking about and celebrating the creativity that can go into mathematics, and that's something I'm really working hard this year to do. So the strategies I'm going to talk about today are ones that I actually use, and I'm and I'm sharing these because I think they're manageable, um, low-risk ways to dip your toes into active learning, and they've worked really well for my students and so I'm hoping that you can get something you can try with your students as well. So go ahead Christine let's look at our first strategy. So this is my classroom and it's not pretty <laughs> but um, these are some pictures of what I use my classroom walls for. Um, I do have a shared classroom but I just decided to take it over. So I want to encourage you to hang up student work and so one of the things that I think is interesting is that we don't often hang up student work in ABE, um, and especially not at the college setting. Um, it doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to be perfect, but these are our shared workspaces that can really encourage a community in the classroom. I also feel like it really helps the students start feeling like a mathematician um, when they can actually see contributions they're making in the room. So even if they're not talking, this is up and people are able to engage in it. And I've actually found that some of my classes that aren't doing the work get really interested and excited and make connections with the things they see posted from other classes. Um, so as you can tell, I just use blue painter's tape and some chart paper, um, and sometimes they start falling over. But this is what my classroom looks like right now if you were to come into it. So hang it up. All right, Christine, let's go to the next one. So one of the things that I think we can do way more of is honoring our students' thinking by using formal and informal names to ideas. So what's really cool about this picture is that we had been working on a topic and we hadn't formalized any sort of formula or any sort of rule yet. And we had a student who made it like made a connection and shared it out loud. And so we called it Kara's conjecture. And what was super powerful about that is it gave her ownership over her ideas. And eventually we did give it the actual name that the mathematical name that they may see in their textbook. But for the rest of the semester, we celebrated this idea and made connections to Kara's conjecture. And it actually was really cool because at the end of the semester, the students thought it'd be really cool if we made band like t-shirts you'd have for a band and call our math band Kara's Conjecture. So it really helped um, really show that every student can contribute in a way that is meaningful, but it also um, 
made it feel less scary. Oh, that's Kara's conjecture. And we were able to use that um, really fluidly in the classroom. All right, next up is you talk, I write. Um, so this is a picture of my classroom board. Um, and one of the things I want you to notice is that I'm writing all over the board, but none of these are my 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 ideas as an instructor. So over the summer, I attended a CGI conference, a cognitively guided instruction conference. And one of the strategies that really connected with me was this idea about you write, or I write, you speak. And so what that allows a student to do is if they don't know how to feel like they can write things on the board or if they have a place to write on the board, um, it kind of lowers the anxiety level. You just say what you're thinking and I'll write it down. And sometimes I write it down exactly how they say it. And sometimes I help them translate it into maybe a more quote unquote mathy um, way of looking at things. And it's really cool because I then name all their things. So if you see the red circles on your screen, um, those are all other people's contributions. So you can see where Kara added in an idea and then Jack has this other way of looking at it. And so all of these um, are different ways that students saw the same problem. And so I always, one of the things I've actually started doing this year was I always put their name by their idea. And so then that makes them feel like a part of the classroom. Um, and it also gives us a connection. So if Jack is able to say this and then Matt was able to riff off of it, Jack and Matt both have really cool things to say. Um, and they're both equally as valuable, even if we don't end up using that specific strategy to go through the final calculations. So this is a low risk way for them to get their ideas on the board. It allows them to also work through their thinking. So they're able to talk it out. And if I show something and they're like, no, no, not, that's not what I meant. We're able to work through what did you mean? How could we show that in a really safe way? So it allows them to modify and refine their ideas as they're sharing in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming. Then I always try to celebrate the process and I always try to thank them for their contribution because it's also like a really big deal to share something. Um, and what I've found is that after I name their ideas a few times, they get really excited and are more likely to share their ideas independently without having to be asked. A riff off of this idea is to have their work be highlighted. So rather than you writing everything on the board, utilize a dot cam or a overhead or whatever technology you may have and show their strategy. So I always will walk around the classroom while students are working on a problem and I'll be like, oh, Hannah, this is so cool. This is a different way to do it. Can I show this up on the board? Um, and I always ask, do you want to show it or do you want me to show it? And the first couple of times, it's usually me walking through through what I see what a fellow mathematician did, but often after just a few times of doing that, they're getting up there and then they're teaching the classroom. So it's really cool and it gives us an opportunity to share strategies. One of the things that I've been trying to do is to give space for students to share different strategies and approaches and highlight um, their creativity and their risk taking in that process. But then I use that as an opportunity um, rather than to value whose strategy was better um, to talk about efficiency and who's able to communicate their thinking in a way that gets us to the answer. Um, I call it the laziest way, but, I, but really the most efficient way. All right, Christine, go for it. So the last thing, this is me. I'm wearing an apron. I look amazing. Um, one of the things that I've also found is really helpful is getting out of the way. So if I am doing all the talking, I know that they're not doing all the learning. So I have found two different strategies that I can use to get out of the way and allow them to lean on each other to do some learning. So the first is Starbucks mode. So this is a picture of my classroom when we had the coffee palooza with Capri Suns. So this day um, was a time where we called our students into Starbucks mode. So when you go to the coffee shop to do work, um, normally you have a task you know you need to complete um, and you have the materials that you need. You normally get yourself cozy and comfy and you maybe you're with your best friend or somebody you really wanna work with um, and you get yourself ready to do your task. 
But what you don't do is rely on your barista to help you do your work, um, which is really, I think, the cool part about this. So once or twice a semester, I bring in snacks because you can't have Starbucks mode without snacks. Um, and we set it up so that everybody's doing their own thing in a place that feels comfortable for them within the room. And we're just there to like check in with them. Do you need a snack or how do you need another pencil? Those kind of things, but we're not there to answer questions. Um, of course we will if we need to, but they really take on the ownership of like, you'd probably ask another person in the, in the cafe for help before you'd go ask your barista. Um, students really enjoy this because they're able to pop in their headphones if they are wanting to work by themselves, but they also really tend to migrate towards groups and they really monitor themselves, you know, quiet voices so that other people can work in groups without disturbing each other. And calling it Starbucks mode really seems to help. The other strategy is the idea of, of win time and win time stands for what I need. And so they're able to communicate what they need. Do they need help with homework questions? Do they need help with looking at notes that they didn't get from being gone um, one of the days? Do they need to work with a tutor? And what we do is we just kind of communicate what we're doing and for, for win time and they're able to go where they need to go. So if they are seeing that there's a group of students who are working on homework stuff, they can go and just be a part of that group and then move fluently, fluidly between groups to get what they need. Um, it's hard to justify sometimes because you're like, oh, I have to get through so much stuff. But what I found is that when they're able to talk to each other, ask each other questions and persevere in some problem solving together, they really don't need us to hold their hand. So this is these are some great strategies for them to talk to each other and for us to be less helpful so that they're the ones really doing the talking and engaging with material. So those are some things that I'm actually doing in my classroom. Um, I like to post a lot of these on Twitter. So some things that I try. So if you um, are on Twitter and you look me up, I'm just Amber Deliger, you can see things that worked really well. And then I also post about things that don't work well, um, but student conversation and, and bringing in student voice so that they're the ones doing the learning is a mission that I'm really um, engaged in this year. So I'd love for you guys to share things that work for you too. Um, so if you are on Twitter, hit me up, follow me and share some good stuff because I need to learn more. So. What kind of questions do you have? I'd love to, if you have any questions to be able to answer some of those. Go ahead uh, and chat them out in the box if you have questions. Um, I'm just struck again, uh, you know, something that Lindsay and I really, really wanted to drive home in our workshop was these thinking strategies are so good for whatever content. I mean, I'm thinking about my ELA class and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I need to put their writing on the, you know, I need to write what they say on the board and I need to put their names by what they say to 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 show the value and I need to get out of their way. I mean, these are these are great strategies. Um, we're going to be talking more about some ELA or, uh, strategies uh, for, that are working in the ESL classroom, but I'm just taking notes here because this is just golden. Um, thank you, Amber, for these great things. Question. Hmm. Elizabeth Bennett. Thank you, Elizabeth. What's your process, Amber, for prioritizing which student work to post without making your classroom walls cluttered and distracted? That is a really great question. I tr So I am in a setting where we take tests with our content. Obviously we are on a semester schedule. Um, so one of the things that I try to do is I try to think about like cycles of material where we're learning something new and then we're practicing it and then we're testing on it. So I try to do it in two ways. One, keeping stuff up for a testing cycle. And then if I know it's tying into the next one, just leaving few bits and pieces pieces up. The other one is on, um, on our learning targets. And if there are some really cool things that really tie into our learning targets, I'll leave them up. So one example would be we tried to figure out all the possible rectangles that we could use um, that had a certain area. 
And we talked about that a lot. And I left those up because not because even after we talked about area and perimeter, I left them up because then we were able to then tie into it coherently when we talked about um, finding all the factors of a number. And so it was really cool to be like, you already know what this is because you made every single possible rectangle with an area of 60. How does that connect into what we're doing? So thinking about that coherence piece. Um, I also try to leave up examples that are highlighting a lot of different approaches and strategies, but I did find out if you leave them up too long, then it becomes white noise in the background and people don't notice it. So I do try to um, move, stuff, move stuff around pretty quickly. Great, thanks Elizabeth and thanks Amber. Um, I I know that for me when I post things, I have to stay on top of it because as Amber said, it, it turns into white noise and with the principles of UDL, we really wanna make sure that what's on our classroom walls is, is very meaningful and it's useful and it's something that we can refer to um, or that students can use during the learning process. Any other questions? Here's a question from Megan. During you talk, I write, do you treat it like a notice and wonder or do you always translate for the student? That's a really awesome question too. I think it depends on what your learning target is or the student who's sharing. I think that's one of the things that's really cool about the art of instruction is that um, we get to know our students and our in our community and know how they're usually how they process things. So I try to think about what I know about them as a learner as I'm guiding them through that process. And sometimes if it's like really I'm trying to hit a specific learning target hard, I'll try to really highlight some of those things. So I guess my answer is, it depends on what my learning target is and my purpose for um, the discussion that day is. Sorry, that was not an answer, but it depends and use, your, use the art of your instruction to guide that. Okay, any other questions? We have time here for another question. If you have one. I just really, I, I just love this. I just, again, it's that idea I always think about is what am I doing that my students could be doing? And um, and this, there's a theme here about students really taking ownership uh, over their learning, which is um, that idea of the ACES tip skills, you know, creating independent learners who can transfer their skills into other contexts. Well, I think that we are gonna move on to Megan. Thank you so much, Amber. It was so good to hear from you <laughs> and hear your voice because I don't get to hear it as much as I used to. So thank you so much. And we are going to go to uh, Megan Himes. And Megan is at Hennepin County Corrections. And she does all the things um, for all the levels in the women's section. So Megan, please tell us all your great stuff. Share with us. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Amber. That was awesome. Um, a hard to follow. Okay, so yes, I'm Megan, and um, I'm at Hennepin County Workhouse it's in the women's section. Like Christine said, all the things, one room schoolhouse, all the levels, so I have ELL all the way up through post GED um, and Accuplacer Prep. So, um, so if I can do it, you can do it. And I, um, what I'm about to share, I also just, I use for um, all subject areas. So not just math, not just RLA or social studies or ELL, um, but for all the subject areas. So um, I will jump right in here. Um, I love what Amber was saying about the, um, whoever's doing the talking is doing the learning. And that's why for me, a lot of this comes from um, building equity in the classroom through dialogue. And because if the students are the ones doing the talking, they're the ones doing the learning. But it's also about autonomy, creating autonomy, and everybody contributes and all contributions are important. Um, and so one way I tackle that is through transparency. And I apologize, I because I'm in corrections, I can't give you lovely pictures of my environment. So if if you're not getting a clear picture through anything I'm describing, you can follow up with me and I will try to be as helpful as possible. Um, but transparency. So um, as soon as a student comes into the classroom, I um, immediately um, during orientation, 
am interviewing them. And I also let them know right, right up front that one expectation I have is that they will participate um, in classroom dialogue. I alleviate the fear of like, oh, I'm quitting today, um, that it won't be immediate. Um, but I also start that with asking them what their experience is with that. I feel like, or actually, at least the trend that I've seen is if I'm asking them, what were your experiences? Um, and if it's yes, then they can start to build on positive experiences they've had. And for students who have had the negative experiences, instead of really focusing on those negative experiences, I then engage them in conversation about and this can be written or oral, depending on the student. Um, I always ask them to give me at least two ways that I could help them be comfortable in the future engaging. And um, that opens up the door for students to really say like, oh, well, if I had time to prepare or if I could write it down first or the things that students have said, because then we can implement that. I can tell them, oh, great, we can try that when it's time for um, you to enter a dialogue. We can put those things into place. Um, but I just try to be as transparent as possible and ask them up front for their input into their journey. Um, and students seem to appreciate that. It also, as Amber is talking about the anxiety, it really alleviates some of that anxiety of, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to talk or participate. In addition to that, I start it off right away with peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So every new student who comes in, um, they have to interview two current students that I have. It's a sh short little interview. The questions are, pre are prepared ahead of time. Um, but two of the questions that they ask their current peers is what it's like to experience the dialogue in the classroom. And so then they already off the bat get to hear from current students what the experience is like. And that again, alleviates more anxiety for them. So they're like, oh, they did it. And this was their experience. Um, and it can be really positive community building as well. Um, and it, and again, it, it immediately starts with that peer to peer interaction. It's not me telling them, they're getting it from people in the classroom. Um, so that being said, um, it does take a little bit of work on the front end. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, Christine, please, um, is that what's really important for students um, also in the classroom is to differentiate the difference between what does it mean to debate, discuss, and have a dialogue. I have been I intentionally use the word dialogue in my classroom um, because of this. I and there is a link here. I won't have Christine open it, but you'll have access to all of these links after. They're to forms that I use in my classroom um, that students have access to. So the the the, the really important key here is that I emphasize to students that debate and discussion are not bad. We don't say they're bad things, but that the point of debate and discussion is to get to a decision, right? A debate, you're right or you're wrong. And they're like, well, but we discuss things all the time. And I say, yes, but think about it. A lot of our students in ABE are parents. And I say like, okay, your child asks you for something and you say, well, we'll discuss it, right? Well, that usually means you've already made up your mind and it's gonna be probably no. Um, and so again, it's aiming towards a decision. And um, dialogue is really about the collective inquiry. It's about exchanging ideas. It's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about trying to reach understanding. Um, and so this is the one um, learning curve for students to get them engaged in dialogue in a meaningful way is to guide them towards dialogue and not debate and discussion. Um, and one thing I've been trying recently, which I wish I could show video, but um, just imagine in your mind, um, is that students, I've been having them write little scripts and then acting out the different ways you would discuss a topic and what would it look like if it was debated, what would it look like if it was being discussed, and then what might it look like if it was engaged in dialogue. Um, and that's been really helpful as a visual for students to see the difference. Um, however, um, next slide, please. This is really big um, risk taking uh, for students. Um, and what I tell students is this, I, I, my job is to help them become comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> I explain to them that when you're uncomfortable, your brain lights up, you're paying attention, you're trying to figure things out and that it's an opportunity for learning. Um, and so the goal is to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and it is, it's risky, but again, some of that um, initially asking them what's going on, 
um, surveying them, getting their input, getting them to interact with their peers right off the bat, giving them language, understanding the difference. This all helps um, them take those risks that's, that are so important for the critical thinking. Um, and then in addition to that, teachers also have to um, take a risk, which is removing themselves. Um, next slide, please, Christine. So that's how us as teachers support this risk taking is that we have to remove ourselves from it. Um, even as Amber was saying, when she has her um, care, or Starbucks day, sorry, I almost said care, uh, Starbucks day, um, it, again, decentralizing ourselves as the as the knowledge keepers um, is the best way to get our students to be the knowledge seekers if they have to talk to each other and we remove ourselves from it. So how do we support our students doing this? Um, so on the next slide here, um, there's, there's a document here, um, again, that you can look at um, after, but it's called Talk Moves. I didn't make this up. You can Google it. There's tons of uh, material out there about it. But this is one thing that I use in my classroom, and we use it for everything um, because it gives students a way to ask each other questions that are open-ended. And um, it helps support the risk-taking. And furthermore, when you're giving them these questions that are open-ended and then they're getting responses back, it then opens the door for them to share back their own ideas. Um, through the questioning, so through that inquiry, they get to the, the agency and the advocacy for their own thoughts and ideas. Um, so by generating these questions and using these questions, they're able to then move into sharing their own ideas. Um, and there's tons out there, and you can you can adjust these to support any level of student and any area you're looking at. Um, these are probably a little bit more sophisticated, but they can start as simple as I agree with you because, or I disagree with you because, um, or oh, thank you for you know that idea. This was my idea. It can be very simple, and then it can build up to more sophisticated talk moves, um, and then. <clears throat> Um, and again, like I was saying, this is what leads to more productive discourse because they be, they start to flow in between uh, the questions into sharing their own ideas. Um, so on the next slide, the balancing of the rocks um, is because it is, again, this is risk taking for them. It's, um, it's not an easy thing to do. And because we as teachers are removing ourselves from it, the way we can support them is by giving them these talk moves um, so that they can have the, these dialogues with each other. Um, the next three slides, um, and so Christine, if you kind of like spend a couple on one and then these are different ways. I have so many different ones that I use in my classroom. This is a menu item. Um, students have these, they're laminated on the desk next to them whenever we're participating in dialogue. And, um, and you can switch it up. You can say you have to choose from one. This is a menu version, and usually if, we're, if a student is using this, I tell them they have to pick three categories. This one is just for math, um, but you can adjust it, again, for any subject. And it just gives them some ways to engage with each other um, when they're like, I don't know what to ask, I don't know what to say. Um, and then I always usually tell students they have to say at least three different ones. This is one of the earlier ones I used. Uh, it honestly is a little cumbersome, so, but I still have some students who prefer it and they get to choose whichever support they want. Um, and so I still have some students who still choose this one. Um, and so this is super helpful. And then I also have this posted on the projector whenever we're having a dialogue and so that they can look up or I will just pick two or three that I put up. Um, and then depending on my level of student, then I just adjust um, as to, to what we're working on, or as Amber said, you just adjust depending on your learning target. Um, so then what do they talk about, right? How do we get them to talk about different things? I think it's easy to see maybe how you would engage them in social studies or um, RLA. But then on the next slide here um, is how you might get them to have a dialogue, an open-ended dialogue about math. And it can even be a low level math problem. And you could even change here the variable and, you know, and say, oh, and instead of asking, the trick is, it's the questions. Instead of saying like, what is the value of X? The overall question being posed at the opening of a seminar would be, you know, do math symbols have the same sense that language has? Um, and 
Um, and that's a way for students to get into talking about it without having to know the math, right? Um, it's low level, it's low risk. They can be like, oh yes, it is like language or it isn't, or what do you mean? Can someone tell me what they think? Um, but this is just one way I wanted to throw some math in there so you could see this can be used with math. This isn't just for um, ELL or RLA or uh, social studies. Um, and then preparing the students. So on this next slide is, these are the three key components that I use. First of all, the text that I choose to give them, um, I they get it ahead of time. And then they are allowed to take it away with them and interact with it before they are expected to engage in any dialogue in the classroom about it. It's a very structured um, experience. And when they take it away, I require that they come through or they come back with either three questions or three responses that they can then be ready to share. This is super helpful for students because instead of coming in like, um, um, or being put on the spot, they've had time to look at it. They've had time to interact with it and now they have something written down on the paper that they can work with so they're not having to think on their feet or off the cuff until they're more comfortable doing that um, so again another support built in just to support them and so um, so they have something to share uh, reflection I will um, go into that a little bit more briefly I want to before I go over time here I want to show you some of the structure the other so on the next few slides um, there are multiple ways that I do this in my classroom. Um, the first two, one is just a single circle, um, which is great to have the students facing each other. And um, while there are sometimes even here cultural differences between whether or not it's okay to make eye contact and things of that, we do discuss that. Um, but it's still the circle. I, I tell the students that because you're putting your information into the middle because your information is important important and I'm the teacher but I'm outside of it I'm not on the inside of the circle um, and they're not feeding information to me they're sharing it with each other uh, I tend not to use a single circle very often though on the next slide um, the fishbowl is more um, in my <coughs> experience better because what I do is the inside circle is talking they're the ones having the dialogue and that's usually my students who have been here a little longer and have they've they've experienced this a bit more they're more comfortable and then newer students are in the outer circle and they still have an assignment and they're still observing and taking notes on what's happening but they're not right on the off the bat put up to like have to have a dialogue with their peers they can see how it's done which again relieves some of the anxiety um, but my favorite, which is on the next slide that I use, is I make teams. So the picture on the right um, shows circles, or there's a circle of desks in the middle, and then there's two arrows. Um, so those are their teammates. And I will structure a dialogue. So the dialogue will start with the students in the middle, and then we'll take little 30 second breaks, and they will turn to their outside partners for help or to discuss what's going on and then turn back and re-engage in the dialogue again. Um, and this has been extremely um, beneficial in my classroom because they're, the newer students can sit on the outside, although some jump right into the middle. Um, and But it gives them a way to feel like they're part of the process. They get to see how what they're saying is being brought up in the dialogue and pushing the understanding of the group. Um, and then the most important part, so you can, uh, two slides. We can skip the next one. Yep, so go ahead. There we go. And then, um, but the most important out of all of this um, is reflection. Having students reflect on what they share. Uh, for me, I have been having students do reflection from the beginning and the students who engage, who don't engage in the reflection don't get as much out of the process. Um, but the reflection is so important because it transitions the experience in, into the actual learning. And they're making the connections between, oh, I read this ahead of time, this is what I brought to the table, and then this is what everybody else was contributing, and then it changed into this. Um, and so, and it also gives them a chance to reflect on if they weren't talking, like, oh, this is what I heard. And then part of the rubric here, which again, you can um, look at after the web webinar. Um, but part of what I asked too is, if you didn't speak, what might you have said? Or, right, what, what, 
what might you have wanted to engage with? Um, but the reflection piece is just as important as that intro of asking them what their experience has been is because it's their direct, their thinking about their own thinking. That's where the real um, critical <clears throat> thinking and metacognition comes up um, is that afterwards of like reflecting on what happened. Um, and that is it. If you have some questions for, oh, I don't know what, oh, no, I accidentally clicked. Oh, so when okay. we do post, yeah, when we do post these um, webinar links and we post them in the Schoology groups, you'll be able to go ahead and uh, go to um, these different resources. Um, one thing I'd like to say as you're thinking about questions for the chat box is um, I love the reflecting on the process. I talk about this a lot, not just reflecting on the content, but the process. That's such a big that's just such a big deal, and I think it's another great ACES tip skill. And also, I like the fishbowl or some of these other um, setups because one of the things I struggle with is I can get students talking, but giving them very intentional listening tasks. And so, for a fishbowl, uh, for example, you know, there are students who have a very intentional learning task or listening task while other students are talking. So, I love that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and it looks like someone asked, I or maybe it was answered. Yes, RLA, I actually am referring to both the reading language arts and GED reasoning through language arts. Thank you. Thanks to those of you who responded to the RLA question. Um, Jessica has a question. Can you give an example of a prompt for the fishbowl dialogue and then an example of the type of task you would give the outer circle to keep them engaged? Yeah, so an example for the fishbowl would be, so any content you're working with. So um, this, this, the last seminar that I just had um, was a history one. And the, the, well, what they were reading was, it was for my GED students. Um, but the, the reading, they were comparing, they were talking about the Articles of Confederation um, and the Constitution. Um, and so they had prepared, um, they had two days to prepare and they came. The, and so they started the dialogue in the middle because they actually come up with their own questions that they're asking. I don't provide them with the questions. So they are developing their own questions um, based on some of the supports that I offer with the talk moves. Um, and, um, and then the outer participants, they are actually, they're doing a peer review. So they'll be asked, the person sitting in front of you, like you're tracking what they're saying. What were they contributing? Um, your thoughts on what they're contributing. How would you interact with that material? So they're doing it more through written form, even though they're not having to speak. Um, but another thing that I've done with the fishbowl is that in another way to keep them engaged is they have whiteboards to write on. And if they have something or a question that they want to offer, but, but because they're on the outside of the circle, they can actually put it on the whiteboard and either pass it into the middle or hold it up. And somebody who's in the middle can decide to like read off their whiteboard and take that and offer it to the group. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways to use it. Um, but essentially the people that are on the outside they're, they're required to be participating through written form and observing what's happening, um, not just sitting there doing nothing. And yes, if someone refuses to participate, um, I hope that I answer that question. If not, let me know, I can try to be more specific. Um, but what do I do if someone refuses to participate? So um, I will tell you the first few times that I ever did this in my classroom, um, it was silent, um, nobody spoke. And I actually had a couple of students get up and leave, but, um, and as strange as this may sound, I still did nothing. I sat and I said, you've, right, we went over this, you've prepared for this, this is what's happening. And so I said nothing. And what ended up happening was they realized like, oh, she's really not going to jump in and save us. And so after that, by the third time that we tried it, um, and I gave a good 15, 20 minutes of, of not talking. Um, they actually started to engage with each other. So um, it's, um, 
you know, depending on your students and how much preparation you do, I, I here for me, I, I say if you're not going to participate, then you need to go. Um, and because the people there need to be engaged for it to be a meaningful experience, um, you'd have to do, deal with that based on however you deal with things in your classroom. However, here, when I've been like, nope, we're, this is what we're doing, they tend to get engaged. And now that I've built a culture around it, I have less of that, so. Okay, we're going to move on here in just a moment. Megan, thank you. Um, I'm already seeing that this webinar is one that I'm going to need to rewatch myself um, as I'm focusing on clicking the slides because there's so much here. And um, one thing I did learn recently in a workshop was um, we often pair students together, but pulling in a third student to give an intentional learning task, for example, if two students are, you, you have two students debating something, the third student could be listening for certain academic signal words, or the third student can then say, okay, so I've heard both of you, and this is, this is kind of synthesizing where I think you landed. And I mean, it's just that third, bringing that third student into a pair and giving them an additional task, I think is very interesting. And um, it's kind of like the fishbowl. Thank you so much, Megan. It was wonderful. And um, we are going to move on to our final panelist, Jessica Jones. Uh, Jessica Jones teaches high intermediate and advanced ESL at Open Door Learning Center. And um, again, just Go ahead, Jessica, and tell me when you'd like me to click the slides. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so my context is about, you know, 20 to 24 students with a pretty wide range. Um, and I also, I, I probably won't talk as much about the reasons behind some of these activities because you've heard a lot of good reasoning already, and I would just end up repeating what they've said. Um, I do also use talk moves in my class, um, although at the level that I'm at, a lot of it is just breaking down the, um, the way students have been socialized in the classroom to respond always to the teacher and trying to redirect that language toward each other. And so a lot of what you'll see uh, today are activities that I use to get students talking to each other, which frees me up then to be able to walk around and observe and listen for some of that um, thinking that they're doing to try to understand what's going on. All right, let's uh, see the first slide. So this is uh, just a simple routine that's built into any activity that comes up um, either in my own materials or in materials from a textbook where students were asked to write answers to comprehension questions or especially if it's a multiple choice question activity. That as soon as they're done, the next step is to compare their answers with a partner and talk about those answers using these three prompt questions. And the students who've been in the class now have internalized those questions to the point where I don't even have to post them anymore. Um, and so just talking about why did you choose that answer and then what evidence from the text supports that answer. And what's interesting is in the beginning, you need both of those questions, even though they ideally both get to the same thing. In the beginning, sometimes the answer to why did you choose that, in fact, has nothing to do with the evidence in the text. And so then the third question really prompts them to go back and show their partner exactly where in the text they found evidence to support their answer. And um, it's been really transformative because the more we do it, and there's usually lots of opportunities in published materials to practice this with multiple choice questions, the more we do it, then the more I hear students using those prompts um, in other parts of classroom work and in groups. All right, let's go to the next one. So, um, this is a strategy that 
we use, it's posted on a poster on the wall and we use it for um, almost any text that requires a little digging in that, this, that I want the students to do together. And that's most texts. I don't do a lot of guiding them through texts. I'd rather have them guide each other through it. And that frees me up then to walk around, listen in, and provide some just as needed guidance. Um, so in this strategy, they know that they're going to choose one person in their group. This is usually in groups of three, sometimes as many as four, sometimes pairs. Um, one person's going to read a paragraph aloud. And as soon as they get to the end of the paragraph, they're going to stop and start to talk about difficult words in the paragraph. Now, before I introduced this strategy, I did a lot of work with them just on um, strategies for finding the meanings of different words. So they now know that they can use provided dictionaries in the classroom. We have kind of a preferred online dictionary that we use. They know that if it's um, depending, if it's a noun, they might be able to use an image search to find that word, um, or that they can refer to other students and teachers, um, and that if they're using a translator of some kind, they're going to compare that translation with some other source of information to make sure that the translation fits. And so then they have, um, they have more sentence frames they can use specifically to talk about vocabulary. And those sentence frames sound like, um, I think this word means, or I see in my dictionary that this word means, or an example of this is. And so once they feel like they've uh, adequately tackled the vocabulary there, then um, they all cover the paragraph and take turns summarizing the ideas. And this regular practice with paraphrasing has been so valuable and the students like it because they know that they need that type of speaking practice and in a large class it can sometimes be difficult to build in enough speaking practice and enough teacher feedback on that speaking practice and this way they get to practice speaking and their group can help hold them accountable for the ideas in the text. And then they use that as a way to check their comprehension before they move on to the next paragraph. So we talk about if you cover it and you try to summarize it and you can really only kind of come up with a few words, then that's a signal that you need to go back and read it again. Or if you summarize it and the rest of your group says, I don't think that's what it means, then that's also a signal that you're going to go back as a group, read it again, and dig a little deeper. Um, all right, I guess I'll, we will, that's enough on that. So I'll let you go to the next one. And then finally, this is kind of my favorite go-to activity. I developed this activity um, with the idea of getting students to be able to guide their own conversation groups and just have more opportunities for sustained conversation. And so when we do this activity, it can last for, you know, at max up to 30 minutes. Um, and for an intermediate ESL student, that's a long time to stay engaged in a conversation. But I find that they're having a lot of fun, they're enjoying it, they stay really focused. So the way this works is um, it's ideally done with a group of four, but it can be um, three or five. And so each person gets a copy of some conversation questions. Uh, for example, I have in front of me the questions from our housing and community unit, and they vary from, um, they're all open-ended questions, but they vary from some easier questions like, what do you like about your community? Or how is your community now different from other communities where you've lived? up to more challenging questions like how do you think natural disasters affect the way people build their homes 
And so in this, each person has a role. Person number one is gonna choose one question from the list and read it out loud. Person number two answers that question. And then person number three needs to summarize the answer they just heard from speaker number two. And finally, speak, person number four is going to ask a follow-up question to the speaker who answered it, number two. And so they know that those follow-up questions are not to be found on their conversation sheet. They have to be their own ideas, but that they generate by listening carefully to the speaker and then asking them something that they want to know more about what the person has said. And often for students who are just getting used to that, that starts with sort of a really simple why question. Um, but over time, I see that students are asking more um, thoughtful and um, probing questions to each other. And then as soon as they've completed those four roles, they rotate that inside sheet a quarter turn, and now each person has a new role, and they pick a new question, and they go through the same steps again. Uh, if we only have three people in a group, then roles three and four, or sorry, roles one and four get combined. So the same person who asked the original question asks a follow-up question. If we have five people in the group, we just ask two follow-up questions. Um, so I think that's it. This is the activity that I find it's very low prep. The prep is mostly just coming up with conversation questions. And that can be nicely scaled to different levels. So you could even potentially have different groups reading questions at different levels in your classroom. Um, and it's the one that when I present on this, teachers email me later and say like, I did this and it was magic and it was great and it was so easy. So uh, I hope it's valuable for you. I can see it kind of being magic, definitely. I'm, I'm already thinking of, do, you know, how I would do this with my students. And um, please um, chat out if you have some questions for Jessica while you're thinking. Um, oh, Denise already commented. I can't wait to use that. I completely agree <laughs> with Denise. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking so much about um, the, the themes of soft skills today. This, you know, steps for problem solving seeking out resources, listening intentionally, being metacognitive, learning how to ask for clarification, sequencing info to be able to summarize. Um, I always talk about how the ACEs TIF skills literally are the tools our students need to do a lot of the rigorous work of the standards. And I just think that so far, everything I've heard really supports that. Um, so I I don't know if any of you agree with that, but I just think that all of like the useful job skills and and post secondary skills and just communication and thinking skills presented today um, just are those transferable skills that our students can take to into their lives. Meg or Megan, I love this idea. I want to use this. I, I think that a lot of us are going to walk away today with a bunch of new things to try <laughs> in the coming weeks. Any other comments or questions for Jessica? Or any of our panelists? Thank you, Astrid. Questions for Amber, questions for Megan, or questions for Jessica? I'm giving you wait time. <laughs> Well, one thing that we'd sure love for you to do right now is chat out one thing that you think you're going to take back and try. Maybe next week, maybe in the coming week or month. What is something you've heard today that you definitely want to try? Go ahead and chat that out. We'll give you a few minutes.
Megan definitely wants to try the Starbucks mode, the Starbucks mode and conversation groups. I know something that I just am going to do immediately is laminate talk moves, um, <laughs> just so that students can reuse those and have those at the table. Uh, Carol says conversation groups and adapting them for writing exercises. Absolutely. I mean, we know that students need to talk through um, ideas and have that conversation, and that's a wonderful scaffold and necessary scaffold before they write. Amber, I love the idea Megan presented on the purpose, intent of different kinds of communication. I agree with that completely. Um, I can imagine all of us would benefit from that. Absolutely. And Emily, I'm going to share the conversation groups too. Sure, I, I hope that many of you will take some of these ideas, share them with your colleagues, or definitely point them in the direction of watching the recording of the webinar. Any other pieces that you've heard today that you really think, wow, you know, I could adapt this with my students, or this, this is just something that I've been missing that's going to help increase the talk, increase the listening tasks in the room? Amber has a request. Uh, someone make some math conversation group prompts and share them with me. <laughs> or share them, thank you Astrid, or share them on our math Schoology group. I noticed that the math Schoology group on and off is, is pretty active. So keep that going. Anything else anyone would like to share before we move on to some announcements? Thank you so much um, to our panelists. Um, it, I think it's just so great to hear from people talk about things they're actually doing and the results that they're getting in their classrooms. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, we have one more comment, Jessica. I've used conversation groups to get to talk about some of students' emotions about math and test taking. That's a great idea. I know that um, uh, Lindsay talked a little bit about that, doing something called Chalk Talk and putting statements down about people's feelings about math and having students uh, engage in a writing dialogue. Rebecca said, oh, she just joined and she's super glad that the recording will be posted on Schoology. Absolutely, Rebecca, you're going to love, love this webinar. Let's go ahead. And um, I'm going to just talk uh, uh, one more slide here, and then I think we're going to hear from um, Patsy. So we do have a CCRS Implementation Networking and Resource Group. And um, if you're not part of it, please be part of it. And if you are part of it, please consider posting a question, a strategy. Um, we know that our panelists were gracious enough to share today, but we also know that many of you are doing some outstanding um, tasks, activities, strategies in your classrooms that, that other teachers would benefit so much from hearing about. So make sure you check your notification settings and that you are actually um, receiving any updates um, or comments. And uh, it's just a great place to get updates, share resources, and network with others around the CCRS. Patsy, would you like to talk a little bit about some upcoming things? Sure. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Oh, good. So uh, yeah, one of the things, of course, to do is, as uh, Christine said, to stay on top of our Schoology groups. So we've got any number of Schoology groups. You might want to take a picture of this slide or wait for it to arrive in your inbox. But uh, all kinds of codes here to help you get connected with uh, colleagues doing similar work and thinking about similar things. I'm not going to go through them line by line, but needless to say, there are lots of ways to stay connected with uh, colleagues, even if you are not in a large program or even if you teach off-site. Um, so lots of ways to, to pose questions and share resources. And another thing to know is that we have an, uh, one more uh, CCRS implementation support webinar coming up in March. So this one is going to be March 18th. And we have yet to um, zoom in exactly on what topic we are going to tackle 
Uh, we've had a couple of really excellent webinars this year already, one this fall, and then of course today's, and we have one more, and we are curious what ideas you might have. Is there kind of a, a logical follow-up that you would like? Is there a topic around CCRS that is something you would like us to spend a little more time on? You have the, our ears, so let's use the chat box for a moment, and I'll just let you write down one idea doesn't have to be a big idea, just something that you're thinking about that you would you could use a little more support around as far as CCRS implementation. It could be subject specific around English language arts or math. It could be more programmatic. Um, it could be something like we've talked about today that kind of spans both subject areas. So Astrid's given us a couple of prompts. What would you like us to focus on? And what are your challenges as far as implementing CCRS? I'll give you a moment. Let's hear a few ideas. So Susan suggests diving a little deeper, more practice developing questions that require complex thinking about text. Oh, thank you. That's a great suggestion. And we, of course, will record these and bring them to our next lead team meeting where we discuss all the things. So other ideas from the group around what you might like us to focus on in March. Well, feel free to continue using the chat box or email us directly or uh, you can email Christine directly. You've got her email on the final slide that'll come up in a little bit. Let's go ahead and move on to some reminders of things that are up and coming. Actually, Christine, I'll let you talk about the CCRS workouts. Sure. Uh, this is a work in progress, um, but we are starting to get more of them up. Um, if you go onto the Atlas website and you look um, under resources and the CCR standards, um, you can see circled here um, that we have ELA teacher workouts and math teacher workouts. And we've got um, several posted um, for both ELA and math. And um, oh, I see Lindsay's here. Yay. Um, so uh, please check these out. These are very short um, uh, little workouts. Just we talk about um, just little workouts, 20 to 40 minutes. You can do them on your own. You can do them with a colleague. You can do them um, in a PLC. Um, you could maybe bring them and to a staff meeting and have um, staff members um, do the workout. They're meant to be short, but to focus in on something that hopefully will be helpful in implementing um, the shifts or um, in the case of math shifts or math practices. check them out and they will be, uh, the list will be growing as the year goes on. Great, thanks. We had a good uh, suggestion from Elizabeth Bennett around supporting learners at lower reading levels as well. That's a great idea. We'll jot that down. A couple thoughts about some upcoming PD. There is always something to attend and coming up this next couple of months here are our spring regionals. Our metro event, if you live in the metro area, is at the Doubletree Roseville on March 6th. North will be in Grand Rapids on March 26th and 27th. And if you're in the southern area of the state, we will be in Mankato on Friday, April 17th, so mark your calendars. Uh, registration opens for those generally about a month out. Uh, we have a couple more webinars to the season. We've got an Adult Career Pathways webinar coming up on February 20th, and this one is on enrollment, retention, and marketing for Adult Career Pathways. I think there might be one more below. Yep, and then another one, uh, also Career Pathways related, but really specifically around One Room Schoolhouse. Uh, how can we support Career Pathways work in a complex setting that has turbulent attendance and multi-levels, maybe a drop-in setting? Uh, so we're grateful for the leadership of Heather Turngren with the ACP one on February 20th and Elizabeth Bennett on March 3rd. Also coming up, something you may not have heard about yet. This is the Instructional Leadership Summit that is happening on May 8th here at Hamlin. If you are someone who's involved with some kind of leadership or uh, staff development or have fallen into a role of coaching a little bit around CCRS at your program, this is for you. So what we came to understand is that after a few years of working with CCRS implementation, a lot of teachers were being tasked with doing some of the uh, professional development back at their sites and in their programs as someone who perhaps completed the cohort or has interacted with the standards a lot. 
um, then being asked to do a meeting or facilitate a PLC or lead some resource evaluation or perhaps put on uh, some other kind of activity in order to get their colleagues up to speed, maybe getting new staff up to speed with the standards, etc. cetera. Um, without a lot perhaps of guidance on exactly what you're supposed to do or how or how do you do that best. So this is a, um, a, a summit, a gathering of leaders um, around those who are involved with some kind of leadership around CCRS uh, implementation at their sites. Also to note is that we will have a cohort next year. So many of you on this have no doubt already been through our CCRS implementation cohort, that year-long um, work around uh, you choose either English language arts or math and you work with Christine and Lindsay around that for a full year with a team from your program. We will be doing that again September of this year through June. Applications will be available very soon. Oh, do June 1st, there you go. <laughs> um, another thing to know, of course, if you are someone who interacts with math instruction, the MCTM conference is coming up April 24-25 in Duluth. We have lots of scholarships available and would be delighted to help you get there. So at the Atlas website, you can apply. Um, it's first come, first serve. That's how we're doing it. You don't have to make your case, you just have to do it soon. So uh, $500 for travel which will cover your registration and hotel and whatever is left towards your expenses. So uh, we really hope to get as many math teachers to that conference as possible. This is the Minnesota Council for Teachers of Mathematics. It is a state conference. Anyone who teaches math in any fashion but from pre-kindergarten through college level, uh, it's really a way to meet other math educators throughout the state. So you'll find that online. And we are going to finish up here. I'll just open the, uh, the floor if there are any additional questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat box, but if you have anything else, please let us know what kinds of things are on your minds, either around the topic today or around CCRS implementation in general, and we will respond as we can. I think we just have one final slide, Christine, before we sign off. And we certainly want to thank all of our panelists. So thank you, thank you, Amber, Jessica, and Megan for sharing your time and your expertise and putting your slides together. We plan uh, to send a follow-up email to, so everyone who was on the webinar today will get an email, of course, with your CEUs for your time today, as well as a PDF of these slides. And I'll take care of that uh, via Gail, who is our CEU guru over at Atlas. So she will send that to you. It might take a couple of days for us to um, get that together, but you should see it early next week at the latest. We'll also put the slides um, in the Schoology group, I assume, uh, Christine? So yes, we, we can, will. Yeah, so get those to you as well. Nothing else?